Show day for the first ring roasts arrived, and everything was going off without a hitch. Everyone made it into town okay. None of the other comics had pulled a levy. They were all coming. The venue was being set up, and we looked ready. Now, you might recall Ring Roasts 1 is best remembered for two events, and neither one involved comedy. Shortly after the show began, I remember standing on the back of the camera platform, surveying the scene. The dais was having a blast, the fans were super responsive, and the line at the bar in the room was long. The laughter should continue well into the evening. I even remember Terrence from Legends of the Ring coming up to me excitedly and saying, We have to do this every year. So far, so good, I said cautiously. I've been on a live stage enough times to know the show is over when the lights go off. The night was young. Plus, there was added pressure on us because the deal we made was that Legends of the Ring had the house and we had the video rights. The house was great. We had to make an afterlife out of this with the DVD sales or this would be a very expensive night out for the crew and I. The comics were killing. They were all quite good, but I have to say I was most impressed by Ryan Marr. I didn't know Ryan. No one there did. His mom didn't come. I can give Ryan shit because he blew me away and I put him on all three ring roasts. His timing was great and he buried everyone. He was up first and while that's not the most advantageous spot for a performer, it actually worked for him because after his set, everyone was playing catch up. It's a shame he isn't working anymore. The room was not only full of fans, but interspersed throughout were wrestlers. This event was the talk of the town, well the wrestling town, and they wanted to see it. Mean Gene Okerlund, the iconic WWE, WCW, and AWA announcer, was seated in the front row. Prior to the show, he came up to me rather concerned that he might be caught by our cameras attending, oh my gosh, a non-WWE event. Perish the thought. Did producers deal with this when Gene went to see Barry Manilow? Say, fella, those cameras can't get me if I'm sitting here, can they? The telltale baritone voice asked me. If I were on my game, I would have sat him down, then sent the handheld cameraman to pull up a chair beside him. I assured Gene he was safe from such a fate. Kevin Sullivan, Raven, Virgil, and a host of legends were on hand to have a laugh at the inside humor that this first wrestling roast would provide. The great thing about this was so many fans had insider knowledge of the wrestling business, with the newsletters and programs like ours lighting the way. They could get the joke and laugh right alongside the wrestlers. The fans were having a blast sitting amongst their idols in the main ballroom and laughing at the jokes about Morocco snorting dandruff and Sheiky failing a piss test. This was unique, and the workers were laughing as hard as the fans. So I didn't think twice when I saw Scott Hall enter the room. Scott came in that night from another planet. He was stumbling and kind of wandering aimlessly in the back of the house behind our camera equipment where there was a bunch of open space. Some fans began to notice him and started shouting out to him. There was a very well-organized show happening on stage, and the distraction pissed me off. Scott was loving it, though, unaware and without a care that he was stealing thunder from other wrestlers on the dais. More and more catcalls began to happen as attention began shifting to Hall. He was clearly in here on a mission to make a scene. Razor! 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 The crowd was now chanting. Hall is doing the crotch chop now to the delight of fans now cheering above the show on stage. I was debating making the call to halt what's happening on stage until the crowd died down and got bored or Scott fell down and went to sleep. Scott jumped onto the camera platform and was now holding his hand up to the ear, enticing the rabid crowd who now all began to revel in the spontaneity of an NWO style run in. I slid next to Scott and asked him if he wanted to go up and do a set because this was not working for the show. Uh, I don't know the Sheik, he slurred. Okay, so instead, let's stand on the platform and continue this for a while. I recall only thinking that, but maybe I did say it out loud because that's exactly what he did. Comic Jimmy Graham was at the mic, and Hall began to heckle him loudly. Hall wasn't getting the jokes, and he could barely hear them over his own booing. He just wanted to start some shit. Ha ha ha, real funny. Don't quit your day job. Scott is bellowing. You know, clever promos like that. Unfortunately, the timing of one of Graham's jokes was the perfect storm. Scott paused, the room quieted, and Jimmy Graham came to a joke involving Owen Hart's tragic fall and death in the ring. Bang! Scott got his opportunity. Highly offended and getting his wish to be highly offended, he jumped off the camera platform, 
tripping our main power supply in the process and killing all cameras except the one isolated handheld that was wandering the front of the stage area. He headed for the stage and grabbed the comic by the neck and drove him backwards, pinning him against the rear wall of the stage. Wrestlers and our security head, Cliff, got Scott away from Jimmy Graham. This was so unprofessional, and I was ashamed that this event that I thought could be a cousin, however distant, of the legitimate comedy world was degenerating into a sloppy, lowbrow wrestling event. All of my protestations and disclaimers that accompany the word wrestling when talking with people in the legit film and television world are suddenly justified by moments like this. Despite my positioning myself as an artiste in that last paragraph, if you watch footage of this attack, I can be seen rushing to the stage holding a blank video release to have Scott sign. Fans are out of their seats and it is utter chaos. I stopped the show as former wrestler Jim Powers, one half of the Young Stallions for Christ's sake, is trying to wrangle Scott. As I understood it, Scott was partying in Powers' room before heading down here. I was happy Powers wanted to move that party back upstairs. Scott had released Jimmy Graham and now took the mic and sought this opportunity to reclaim the honor of his fallen friend, Owen Hart. He began slurring into the mic that everyone should ask God to say hi to Owen. Owen, from what I've heard of him, was probably pissing his pants laughing from above while planning the prank phone call he'd be making from the heavens to the hotel about a lawsuit later. Scott then finished off the touching memorial with a series of DX suck at crotch chops. He left the stage and began walking the crowd, making a scene now, as fans just started kind of following along like an ECW into the crowd brawl. It was impossible to get Scott out of the room. He just kept going from area to area, dropping in a seat, getting up, walking to another seat. Jim Powers is doing his damnedest to get him out, even using some physicality with Scott, and Powers still looked like he did in his heyday. James came up to me and assured me they were going to get Scott to sit down and relax. Get him the fuck out of here, I yelled. Just call the cops. End it. After 20 minutes or so, Hall wandered out. As I understand it, he went into the hotel bar got into an altercation with a patron, and was arrested by New Jersey state troopers. He should have gone back up to Power's room and finished his weed. Back in the ballroom, our cameras were back up, and Kevin Sullivan asked for the microphone and spoke to the audience to get them to restore order. He worked his magic, and the crowd began to settle in for the second half of the show. They couldn't say they didn't get their money's worth thus far. Eric Sims' set bombed horrendously, but he was addressing an incredibly raucous crowd after the Scott Hall incident. I thought a few of his jokes were funny. I wrote them. The second event for which Ring Roasts lives in infamy involved Brian Blair and the Iron Sheik. Brian Blair's set did nothing to ease the tensions between he and Sheiky. It was a roast, after all, but the known history, however mysterious its origins beyond Sheik offering to humble Brian's ass, made it a nail-biter for the audience who didn't laugh as much as they oohed and aahed. The camera caught Sheiky's discomfort very clearly. This wasn't going over well. The tension was compelling, but maybe this was a mistake. Maybe Kaz would be pissed at me for inviting Blair. At the conclusion of the show, I asked Sheik and Brian Blair to shake hands to close the show. It would be a good moment for the show and would also put a punctuation mark on the strange feud. Brian didn't so much have issues with Kaz. His jokes may have been a little stiff at the roast, but he'd been listening to the Iron Sheik say he should have broken his back and humbled him all over the place, from shoot videos to Howard Stern. Shit, I would have been stiff too. When Brian and Kaz came face to face at the podium, Brian was smiling and ready to shake. Kaz was neither smiling nor ready to shake Brian's hand. I stood between them, a step back so they could share the spotlight. Sheik now starts berating Blair and cutting a promo on him. Fans are eating it up and Brian is even smiling, indicating to me with a wave of his hand, let him go. Sheik was doing his thing and Brian was smiling and getting a kick out of it. He steps closer and leans into the sheik. I just came here for a handshake from you, Brian says. A handshake? Kaz replies. He then hauls off and smacks Blair across the head with a vicious open hand. It sounded like a gunshot. You can find it on YouTube or on the special features of our DVD. I jump between them, grabbing Blair's arms as he was going to do unholy damage to the aging sheik, who was barely walking at that time. Security hadn't made it on stage yet, so it was just me between them. I look over to Eric Sims, who was just kind of standing there. I screamed at him to get Kaz out of here. I was angry at the whole thing. I tried to talk Blair down, but he was angry, and he felt betrayed by me. 
He was an elected official in Florida, and here he is in some violent incident in New Jersey. I had guaranteed his safety and that he'd be part of a classy entertainment event. This night was a circus. He was bitching me out on the side of the stage, and that is all lovingly caught on camera and part of the extra features on the DVD set. Cliff led us up to the elevators to Brian's room, where I safely deposited him with his traveling companion, the late journalist Mark Nolte. Mark already had the computer up. The story was all over the place. And that's how we planned it. The work or shoot question came up the second this went down, and almost everything audiences saw came off as the perfect shoot. But it wasn't. Late in the afternoon on the day of the show, I was texted by James to come up to a certain room in the hotel. I'd seen all the talent throughout the day as they were coming into the hotel, but between the logistics of the live show and the video shoot, I was busy with the setup. I hadn't seen anyone in a while, and seeing Sean come up to room 315 on my phone made me queasy. What was wrong? Whose flight was delayed? Cancelled. Why is it imperative that this news be told to me in person? Can't he type it? I headed upstairs and was met by James in the hallway. Hey, Brian wants the sheik to hit him, he said. James doesn't do drugs, but I was sure my favorite stocky Brooklynite was high. No way. He doesn't even know why he's pissed at him, I said. I don't think Brian is going to want any part of that. James chuckled. Okay, go inside. I did. I entered the cloudiest, loudest room you could imagine. Making my way through the smoke, I saw Sheiky sitting around with Brian Blair, the Taskmaster Kevin Sullivan, Terrence from Legends of the Ring, and Eric Sims. The Molsons were flowing freely, the music was on, and everyone was laughing and smiling. Was it 1987? Where were the rats? They'd all been talking and thought that there needed to be an altercation to end the show. I had the final yay or nay. I told them off the bat that this had to be believable and we would need to work through this to make sure it came across as organic. We would be skewered for pulling off a shitty indie angle if this was going to be obvious. So we at least had to keep people guessing. We had to work to find a believable scenario. There was a real big part of me that had a problem with what was being discussed. The whole premise of our company was drawing the curtain back on the work and talking about how all the gears turned. Now I'm planning to work fans. I felt like a doctor selling cigarettes out of his office. The logistics of the hit were being discussed. Should he hit him during Brian's set? No, I said. Fans need to get the whole show they paid for. It can happen after. Why wouldn't Brian hit back? I'll grab him, I said. And Eric can grab Kaz. Suddenly, Kevin Sullivan goes into booker mode and starts booking this slap. At least I think it was Kevin, through all the cigarette smoke. Well, it was a small, stocky, gray-haired thing with a Boston accent. Maybe Yoda is from Springfield. Sean, the booker man started, you gotta be involved. You've been on TV shows and you can do this and make it real. I beamed. Oh, wait, it's a wrestling roast. Your face has to be between them, he continued. You're not a wrestler. The people gotta see the shock and horror on your face. That's gonna sell it. And you can do it. Okay, that's it. Where's my Oscar? I suggested that Brian do his set and make it kind of stiff. I told Kaz not to react at all to Brian's set. Don't be angry. Don't make any silly wrestler faces. Just sit and be stoic. Be still. I told Eric not to do anything at all either. Don't comfort Sheik. Don't engage him. He should just be looking around like he's praying for this to end. Just like Sheik should do. No laughter, but also no anger. Just sit through the uncomfortable wait for something annoying to end. The last person up was always the honoree, so Sheiky would have the last set. He would say whatever he was going to, but Blair should come up to the podium and he would get hit. I thought Blair should come up for a handshake to end the show, and I would say that on the mic. It would start to smell like a rat, a big fat travel lodge one. If Blair came up for a confrontation, Sheik hit him and Blair couldn't get one off himself. But if he were really caught off guard, that second of shock would allow me to drop the mic and jump in front of Blair, with Sims pulling Sheik away too. It had to be over as fast as it happened. These things happen in real life in the blink of an eye. No protracted taunting and wrestler shit. Well, Kaz would cut a Sheik-style promo on Blair. Fans paid to see that. But when the good-natured Blair asks for a handshake, and the fans wonder if there will be one, there's the pop, scramble, confusion. What the hell just happened? The only people that knew of this plan were the people in that room, 
plus Anthony and Craig, who were on cameras A and B. I wanted them to be ready, but disorganized. They should fight for the framing a little bit when it happened. The cameras needed to scramble a bit to catch the unplanned fracas. You know, like they didn't do in Montreal for Brett and Sean's Survivor Series. I told our C cameras handheld operator, Tim, to just follow the action. Whatever happens when I leave the stage with Brian Blair, come over and get tight on us. When we leave, walk behind us to the elevator doors, but don't get in. Okay, Anthony and Craig would shoot the mess on the stage, Tim would have good B-roll of that, and then run over and get Blair bitching me out. Blair didn't know I planned to walk him off stage and have a camera run over, but he'd figure it out pretty quickly. All these guys were pros. I was nervous about Eric and Kaz staying straight. I was nervous about the hit looking soft. I decided if anything looked bad, I wasn't putting it on the DVD of the show. I would fade out and go to credits with Blair asking for the handshake. Imagine my surprise when there was a real attack on a comic by a raging drunk wrestler. We might be a little late with the slap. The crowd went wild when Scott Hall attacked Jimmy Graham. They'd have that kind of shit out of their system by the time Sheik got to pop Blair in the mouth. I figured they might yawn at it. The Scott Hall thing was being carried by the wrestling press already. I was getting reports that the Scott Hall attacks comic at Iron Sheik Roast headline was making the rounds. Okay, that got us on the radar tonight. Seems that may have served a purpose after all. People certainly had their camera phones out ready for anything that night after the Hall deal. They'd have something to film at the curtain call. During Blair's set, Sheik and Eric played it off very well. They weren't hokey. They sat and waited expressionless, which to the viewer's eye made them look like they were raging inside. In my film school waste of time, I learned of the Kuleshov effect. Lev Kuleshov was a Soviet filmmaker in the 1920s who crafted a very progressive experiment with film that was light years ahead of its time. Kuleshov intercut a shot of an expressionless actor just staring into the camera with a shot of a bowl of soup, then a girl in a coffin, then a woman on a sofa. When shown to separate audiences, they said upon seeing the man look at the soup that he was hungry. When the man was looking at the girl in the coffin, he was grief-stricken, an audience said. When he was looking at the woman, that particular audience said he was lusting after her. Of course, Kuleshov used the same exact shot of the bored actor for all three films. That ridiculous diatribe is only to illustrate that by having Eric and Kaz do nothing while Blair insulted them, the audience would do everything. The end of the show came and Shiki started his rant. The audience was eating it up. Blair came up with a smile, good-natured, and played his part great. Until the hit, for which Blair stumbled backwards. I felt overselling it, a la Saturday night's main event. That hit was fucking brutal. I was two feet from it, trust me. It would have taken my head off. But not Brian's. Brian was in amazing shape still, and it was an open-hand slap. I'm sure it would have buckled him a bit, maybe knocked him a little off balance into the table on the dais. But Blair spun around and stumbled in the other direction. It was small, but I think that detail put doubt in people's minds. Sure, the jaded wrestling fan would have suggested work the minute they heard that the Sheik hit Blair, but seeing the actual event would not have been an indicator of that. Natural assumption would, but not the visual. And for this to work, I needed that ambiguity. Still, I think it went off rather well. Blair and I had our little exchange for the handheld after the shot, and it followed us to the elevator. Blair and I were on the elevator with someone who we didn't know, as well as Cliff, the security guard. He wasn't smartened up about it either, so Blair and I just stood there in silence in the elevator. Poor Cliff, he's about six foot eight and 300 pounds, looking like a slimmer Mark Henry, and we put his big ass to work that night, between Scott Hall's attack and now this fracas. Whenever I'd see him working security in the months after the event, he would shake his head and just say, No more, please. No more roasts. We got off the elevator on Blair's floor and we walked to his room. I told Cliff I could handle it from here. We were safe. Blair opened his door and we stepped in. When the door closed behind us, Blair turned to me, smiled, and we hugged, laughing. Mark Nulty had all the news sites up. This is crazy, Mark said. Leaving Blair's room, I had some doubt as to whether we pulled it off 100%. Blair's big stumble plus the contrarian nature of the wrestling fan might create a backlash. As I was walking to the elevator, Don Morocco was returning to his room, having done well sitting on the dais being cannon fodder. He was probably 30 feet down the hallway when he saw me and stopped and laughed. 
Okay, I'm a mark now, he began. Was it real? I didn't break my stride to the elevator. It was wrestling, I said. Good night, Don. 